We can rise for a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Having beheld the resurrection of Christ, let us worship the Holy Lord Jesus, the only sinless one. Your cross do we worship, O Christ, and your holy resurrection we praise and glorify. For you are our God, and we know none other beside you. We call upon your name. O come, all you faithful, let us adore Christ's holy resurrection. For lo, through the cross is joy come into all the world. Ever blessing the Lord, let us sing his resurrection. For in that he endured the cross for us, he has destroyed death by death. My hope is the Father, my refuge is the Son, my protection, the Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, glory to you. I place all my hope in you, Mother of God, keep me under your protection. Amen. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome everyone. Very excited, very joyous this day to be starting once again the adult education program. We kind of started it experimentally last year uh, at the request of some. I know in the past it had been done. It kind of fell out of practice here for a little while and it was received very well. And so we've decided to continue uh, going for this year as well. And we're going to be doing once a month on the dates on the sheet and the sheet that I passed out. And so we're going to be meeting here once a month after the liturgy to have a short class, I don't know, discussion, whatever you want to call it, so that we can deepen our faith, so that we can learn about our faith. Uh, because the faith, the Church of Christ and Jesus Christ, is not something that we will ever be able to know everything. It's not something that we can... Uh, get a PhD in Christianity and know everything there is to know about Jesus Christ or about Christianity. Uh, there's a great story of St. Augustine who is trying to think about the mystery of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he's having so much trouble with this dogma. How can one God be three persons? That's a very difficult thing. And he was walking along the beach one day and he saw a small child digging a hole Thinking, you know, imagine a small child on the beach, maybe trying to make a sandcastle, and they have a little hole. And he asks the child and says, Child, my child, what are you doing? And the child responds very innocently, Well, I'm trying to dig a hole big enough to fit the whole ocean. And that's how it is with us trying to learn everything about the faith. Our capacities is like a little hole on the beach, and the truth and the love of God is an entire ocean. So we'll never be able to learn everything, but we can come and uh, progress. We can come and push ourselves forward, push ourselves closer to Christ so that he can also come and draw closer to us. So this year, the theme, we're going to be piggybacking off of last year's theme. Last year's theme was about the divine liturgy, and we spoke specifically about how the liturgy is like heaven, that when we come to church, we're really stepping into a different reality. We're stepping into a new uh, realm of existence. We ourselves are transformed. We are in the presence of Christ. We are in the presence of the Panagia, the Virgin Mary. We are in the presence of the angels and, in, and of the saints. And in the Holy Communion, in the Sacrament of Holy Communion, Christ gives us his own body and his own blood, his true body and blood, and that by partaking of them, we are transformed and we are sanctified. We are given the nourishment to go out back into the world and to be a witness to the truth of the love of Jesus Christ. So that's kind of what we did last year. We focused on that. We talked about church architecture and how it played into that theme. We talked about the prosphoron, the offering bread that we bring to church that is used for Holy Communion. And we talked about all these different ways that the liturgy is like being in heaven. This year, we're going to stick with the theme of the liturgy. But we're going to, instead of talking thematically, instead of saying, okay, the liturgy is heaven on earth, we're going to go through, from my, my goal is to go from beginning of the liturgy, blessed is the kingdom, 
all the way to the end through the prayers of our Holy Fathers. And to go through and look at each aspect, each part of the liturgy, to say, what does this mean? Why do we do this? Why do we say this prayer? What is the meaning of this prayer, this hymn? And uh, to go through it so that we can become more familiar, so that we can become comfortable with the liturgy. Uh, and one of the beautiful things about the liturgy is that no matter what church we go to, the liturgy is the same. So if we make the liturgy the center of our life as Christians, we will always feel at home in an Orthodox church. We'll be able, hopefully, at the end of the year to answer questions like, why do we do entrances? When the altar boys come out of the altar, followed by the priest. Why are prayers and what prayers are said at the different parts and what do they mean? Today we're going to be talking, for example, about why we say, Lord have mercy, and etc., etc., etc. So, the liturgy, of course, is extremely important to us as Orthodox Christians. For all you young people, this is important. The Divine Liturgy is our, the way that we are exposed to Christ. It's the way that we come face to face with Him in our lives. He gave us this. He's the one that gave us this practice. He's the one that gave us the liturgy at the Last Supper when He said to the disciples, Do this in remembrance of Me. And we have been doing this in remembrance of Him for 2,000 years since His death. For modern Christians, the liturgy especially is what we do the most. You know, services like Vespers, services like the Orthros, they're not well attended by our communities, most of them at least. Vespers really we do mostly to celebrate a special day, a special event. But the liturgy, once a week, we can count on it being in our parishes and we can count on being here. So it's the one thing that we do the most. Hopefully by getting to know it a little bit better, it can fuel us to engage even more deeply into the life of the church and then we can grow in our faith and come into contact with Christ himself, especially in the liturgy because he offers us his body and his blood. So with that introduction, we'll get started. Before we dive into the text itself, before we start with blessed is the kingdom, we have to kind of understand that the liturgy breaks down into two sections. Okay? The first section from the beginning up until the gospel or the sermon, depending on when the sermon is given, is called the Liturgy of the Catechumens, or also it's called the Liturgy of the Word. Now I say it depends on when the sermon is given because traditionally the proper place of the sermon is right after the Gospel, which makes sense because oftentimes the preacher will be teaching about the Gospel lesson for the day. So it makes sense that right after you hear the Gospel, the priest will then come out and preach on it and teach about it so that the, the lesson from the Gospel is fresh in our minds. In today's practice, however, a lot of priests, they push the sermon back for different reasons. Um, one of those very practical reasons is in a lot of parishes, uh, it's a late arriving crowd. So if the priest gave the sermon after the gospel, there might only be a third of the congregation in church. Whereas at the end of the service, the people are there and so they can hear the message of the priest that particular Sunday. And there are other reasons as well. Whatever they are, sometimes the sermon moves around. So, the first part, the liturgy of the Word, the liturgy of the catechumens, focuses on just that, the Word. It focuses on the Gospel. It focuses on Christ speaking to us. For example, in this first portion, when the priest begins the liturgy, he lifts up the Gospel book for everyone to see. So the focal point is the Gospel. In the small entrance, the priest is carrying the Gospel. Then we hear the epistle readings of St. Paul. We hear the gospel preached, uh, the gospel preached from the holy gates by the priest, and then we hear the sermon. All of these things have to do with the scripture. They have to do with the word of God being taught to the people. The reason why we call it the liturgy of the catechumens is because what is a catechumen? Anybody know what a catechumen is? Yes. Yeah. So it's a person who is yet to be baptized. It's someone who is studying, who is learning about the faith, so that one day soon they can be baptized and become a full member of the church. So it makes sense then that this first portion, which is about hearing God's word, about learning how to be a Christian, is the part that the catechumens especially were allowed to be present at. In the old church, if you were not a member of the Orthodox Church, after this first portion, you would leave. You would not remain in the church. This has fallen out of practice in recent times. But 
After, basically, from the great entrance on, only the baptized Orthodox Christians would be in the church for the rest of the service. And this is why it's called the Liturgy of the Faithful. Again, nowadays, that's not the practice. People are welcome to stay for the entire service, and so it's kind of transformed over the years. But this is why we call it the Liturgy of the Catechumens and the Liturgy of the Faithful. The Liturgy of the Faithful, if the, if the central part of the Catechumens Liturgy is the Gospel, the central part of the Faithful Liturgy is what? Holy Communion, exactly. And again, that makes sense because only the baptized Orthodox Christians can receive Holy Communion in the Orthodox Church. So, in thinking about these two parts, I, re I read a book, re I'm reading a book by Father Anthony Conieras. He's a priest in Minnesota who I adore, and he has a lot of great analogies. And so he uses this analogy to think about these two different parts. He says, I heard someone explain how dinner is served on the farm. So now imagine a farm house, and, and they're getting dinner ready. So all the children and the hired help come in from the fields at noon. They wash up and they sit down at the table. But before the food is served, first the mail is read. Then instructions are given as to, as to what jobs need to be done in the afternoon and evening. After this is finished, finally the food is served to give everyone that strength to carry out the tasks and the chores for the afternoon. So the, the liturgy, Father Anthony says, is very similar. In the first part of the liturgy, we receive the Word of God. God gives us His instructions. He gives us his message as to how he wants us to live, what he wants us to do, how he wants us to represent him in the world. We receive these instructions through the epistle reading, the gospel lesson, and the sermon. But when we receive those instructions, we are too weak to carry out those instructions in the world. We lack the strength to do so. This is why we need part two. This is why we need the liturgy of the faithful. Because this is the part where God gives us the nourishment. He gives us the food, which is His body and blood. He gives us Himself through the sacrament of Holy Communion so that we can go out and so that we can fulfill the things that the Lord expects of us. So now we can kind of frame the liturgy and how it works every, every Sunday that we come. So in this first portion, the liturgy of the catechumens, the service starts by the priest raising up the gospel book and holding it up for everyone to see, as I said earlier. And he exclaims, he says out loud, very loud for everyone to hear, in a joyous way, he says, Blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and to the ages of ages. Amen. He takes the gospel as he's saying this and he blesses the altar table. Not only the altar table, but specifically the Andimension. For those of you that were at the second class in the spring, I brought out many liturgical items and I brought out many things to kind of like a show and tell. One of those things was the Andimension. I'll bring it out for you now to, to see it as well. So we have an idea. It's this cloth that sits underneath the gospel. And inside this, which is folded up right now, it opens up and there's an icon of the crucifixion which is painted on this cloth piece, and it sits underneath the gifts uh, so that it can collect any crumbs or any pieces that fall. We cannot do a liturgy without one of these. This is a sign that the church has been consecrated and that we have the blessing from our bishop to do a service in this location. The reason why I'm not opening it up is because I just used it, so the crumbs are inside from the liturgy, and if I open it up, they may fall out, and then... Uh, It'll be a very long and arduous process to clean it up. Do we have a question? Uh, when the church was first built, the old church, yes. they didn't have this cloth, did they? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure when the church was... I'm not sure when the church was consecrated. It would have to be through the blessing of the bishop, even though the church was... Some churches are not, have not been consecrated even in Chicago, which is kind of amazing to think about. But uh, they still have the blessing to do the service. Um, it's really not proper. They should, they should have their church, uh, the church uh, consecrated so that the services will be in proper order. But they say that the bishop is the, uh, the tipicon. He is the rule. So if the bishop gives the blessing to serve the service, 
then you can serve the service because the bishop is Christ in our, in our church. So the priest blesses this piece of cloth with the gospel book as he's saying, blessed is the kingdom. By making the sign of the cross over it. So this liturgical statement, blessed is the kingdom, is an announcement of where we are going. Okay? In our previous sessions, we talked about how the liturgy takes us to heaven, the liturgy puts us in heaven. We also talked about how the church, I remember, you talked, remember those of you who were here for the architecture section, we talked about how the church is a ship. We call this section of the church what? Does anybody know? The nave. And that comes from the Greek word naos, which is the root of the word navy, naval, and all those things. It's the root, it means ship. A naos means a ship. So this section that we're in here, the church, is the ship. And so the, the church is carrying us through the many stormy parts of our life. Now, if we were to get on board a, a boat or a ship or a plane or a bus or any vehicle taking us on a journey, what would, the what would be the first thing that would be announced on the trip? But by the pilot. When you're flying a plane, the pilot, after you take off, he gets, on the con he gets on the intercom and he says, this is United Flight 79 going to wherever, Los Angeles. He announces the destination. The same thing when you get on a boat. Uh, the, the captain will tell you what the next stop of the boat is and where the final destination is as well. Same thing with a bus. So this journey that we go on during the liturgy, the destination is announced right away by the priest. The priest says where we are going and where the liturgy will take us. Blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So where are we going? We're going to heaven itself, which is a beautiful way to start off our, our liturgy. This statement makes sense as the beginning of our worship because it is a doxology. What do I mean by doxology? The doxa in Greek means to glorify something, to give glory. So to be a doxology means we are giving glory through our words to God. And St. Nicholas Kavasilas, not, not St. Nicholas of Mida, who, uh, you know, St. Nicholas is connected with Christmas. It, not the same St. Nicholas, St. Nicholas Kavasilas, who wrote an interpretation and an explanation of the liturgy. He explains that in order to have communion with God, which is the point of our service, uh, four ingredients... Four ingredients are necessary. I think it died. It might have batteries upstairs. Okay. So, I don't know if else so we need. Well, there are four ingredients that are needed for true communion with God. The first ingredient is doxology, praising God. The second ingredient is thanksgiving, giving thanks to God, which is similar but not quite the same. The third part is confession, recognizing our faults and our brokenness, and bringing those that brokenness to Christ so that we can be healed. And then the last one is petitions, which is bringing our needs before God. Steve is smart. He's on the speed. Johnny on the spot. Thank you, Steve. So, doxology, thanksgiving, this is on your sheet, I believe, as well. Confession and petition, bringing our needs before God. So, St. Kavasilas continues, and he says that doxology should be the first one. It makes sense that it's the first because when servants approach their master, it makes it better for them to first glorify the master, to praise the master before they bring their needs to the master. It would be very uh, inappropriate, it would be very ungrateful, I would say, if a servant would come into the master's chamber and just start rattling off a list of needs to that uh, master as if it was a, like a... a, a like a food dispenser or like a soda machine, like, oh, I need this, I need this, I need this, and, and we just expect the master to do those things for us. Not that, the, not that our master, our God, does not want to do things for us, but it's more appropriate for us to begin by glorifying him, for praising him for how great and how wonderful he truly is. So we start off by glorifying God and saying, blessed is the kingdom. In response, the people all of the people, should say Amen. Whether there are chanters or whether there is the choir, the responses in the liturgy are meant to be said by everybody. 
because it is a community prayer. It is not the prayer of the priest. It is not the prayer of the chanters. It is not the prayer of the choir. It is our prayer. Even if you just say, Amen, it gives your stamp of approval that the prayer that is being offered is good. I think of the Declaration of Independence. The forefathers of our country, they sat down, took them a long time to write this document, okay? And the document was presented, and what did everybody have to do at the end? They had to sign it. They had to give their stamp of approval that what was written in the document was agreed upon, that they agreed with it, that they thought that it was good. In the same way in the liturgy, when we as a community say amen to the prayers of the priest or to the, to the prayers that are said out loud, we, give our, we put our signature on it. We give our stamp of approval. We put our name next to it saying, yes, this is what I want. By saying amen, we say, yes, heaven is where I want to go as well. Immediately following this first exclamation, blessed is the kingdom, is a big set of petitions. There's 12 petitions. What do I mean when I say a petition? A petition is a very short statement of prayer asking for something specific, okay? Something that is needful in our lives. If we look at this list of petitions, I don't know if you guys have the text in front of you, maybe in the future and the next time we can pass out the books a little bit. We can see that uh, these needs are many and that we pray for things like peace in the world and God knows we need more of that. We pray for all of our churches. We pray for our hierarchs, for the priests and for the deacons and for all of us that are here in church. We pray for travelers. We pray for civil servants, meaning soldiers and those who serve our country and keep us safe. We, ca we pray for the sick. We pray for the suffering, for those who have been taken captive. We pray for ourselves, for a peaceful end to our lives. We pray that we may be repentant and that we may be forgiven of our sins. And so all these petitions are our needs that we bring before God. And these petitions cover every aspect of the human life that is critical to us. Why do we say these petitions? Why is this the first thing? Why some, a lot of times when we are doing something important, we, we either save it for last or we do it first. In the liturgy, we save it for last. Why? Why do we do these petitions first? These seemingly small prayers uh, that may, you know, may or may not be applicable to each one of us. You know? uh, some of these things we may say you know, for those who travel, maybe we don't have anybody in our life that's traveling at that time. But why do we start with these petitions? Well, we have to think of the liturgy, especially this first part of the liturgy, the liturgy of the word, as a discussion, as a conversation that we are having with the Lord. Father Anthony, who I referenced earlier, has another great analogy about why we start our conversation of God this way. And he says, when a couple is courting each other, meaning they're dating, the modern day term would be dating. The young man may bring a box of chocolates to his sweetheart and he'll say, hello dear, I've bought you a present and I hope that you will like it. And she replies, hopefully for him at least, what is it? Oh, how marvelous. You are a perfect dear to have thought of it. That's, an ex that's a quote from Father Anthony. To show, he, you can tell uh, what generation he comes from because I don't think uh, kids these days are, are talking like that to each other. So the exchange begins with a conversation. It begins with them exchanging words to each other. The, you know, in the situation that Father Anthony paints, the, the boy doesn't bring the chocolates and just drop them in the girl's lap. He greets her. He explains what he's doing. He, explain, you know, he, he expresses that he hopes she'll like it. And then the girl responds, and then the gifts are exchanged. And he says, after they talk, they exchange gifts. The girl tastes the candy. She tells, hopefully, the guy how good they are. And then she gives some to him as well so that he can taste and eat as well, so that they can both enjoy the gifts together. He gives to her. She gives to him. So there's an exchange. So the liturgy is the same way. Kind of interesting how these little things that happen in life are representative of the liturgy. So he says, when we come, we come here to give God a gift, whether that's us bringing a prosphora or us just being in church, offering ourselves to Christ, asking to him to 
be a part of our life, we come here to give God a gift. But we can't just do it in silence. We can't just show up and that's it. We have to begin by speaking with God. So we say, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy on us. We offer the petitions. In other words, we're saying, God, you are so wonderful. You are great and you are powerful. How blessed is your kingdom. And we say things like, God, forgive us. We pray for peace, for the good weather, for the sick, just like we're talking about with the petitions. And then, so, then we, so that's how we start. We start by offering our words to Christ. Then, God speaks back to us. Now, many of us, I think, would question that, saying, how does God speak to us? We don't hear God's voice in the liturgy. But, if we think a little closer, we do hear his words. We hear his words through the word, through St. Paul and his epistles, through the gospel writers who teach us what happened in Christ's life, and then finally through the sermon. These are how we receive God's words when we come to church. So we first offer our words to God, and then God offers his words to us. Then, after those words are exchanged, then there comes the exchange of the gifts. We bring ourselves forward to become a part of Christ in Holy Communion, and Christ offers us his body and his blood. So bringing our needs before the Lord is important for that reason. It's an important part of being a Christian in general. In St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, he says, he's comforting the people, and he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In other words, no matter what difficulties we face in our lives, no matter what challenges we have in front of us, if we offer them with humility and thanksgiving to God, he will take care of us. And we know that this is true because he did so through the cross. Through dying on the cross and being resurrected from the dead, he took all the bad things in this world and transformed them into something good. He took everything that was hateful and he turned it into love. He took death itself and he turned it into life. So, this is why we bring our petitions before God. And this is why the Apostle Paul says that it's so important that we do bring those petitions before God. When we ask God to fulfill our needs, especially needs that are critical to our salvation, you know, even though I'm a big Cubs fan today, I didn't say, for the Cubs to win the World Series, let us pray to the Lord. That's not needful for my salvation. As much as I would like to think it is, it's not. <clears throat> so for things that are needful especially, we can be confident that he will do it because he has already shown us his goodness. So, the first of these petitions is, says, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. I'm not going to go through every petition, but I want to focus especially on this first one and the theme of peace. Because throughout the petitions, we see peace over and over and over again. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. For the holy churches for peace in the holy churches of God and for the unity of all let us pray to the Lord for a peaceful end to our lives peace we keep hearing this peace 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 all over over and over again so why do we focus so much on peace well peace is one of the gifts of Christ when Christ died and rose from the dead he met his apostles and he said to them what he said peace be unto you he says it twice in the same meeting he says peace be unto you so Peace is very important. It's one of the gifts that Christ offers us. St. Paul even lists, lists it in the gifts of the Holy Spirit as well. And he says to the church in Colossae, to the Colossians, he says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. So it is our calling as Christians to have peace in our hearts. There's a wonderful book written by Father Stephanos and Agnostopoulos. And it's uh, called The Experiences of the Divine Liturgy. I highly recommend it for anyone. And he says that peace is the oxygen. It is the clean air which the people of God can live on. It is the primary thing that we need in order to stand before God. And this is peace. So our worship is no different. If we want to experience the liturgy in its fullest capacity, we must come with peace in our hearts. Christ says, 
If you are offering a gift at the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, he says, leave the gift there in front of the altar. Basically, drop everything you're doing and first go and be reconciled. First make peace with your brother and sister and then come back and offer your gift. If we come to church with anger or with hatred or with division in our hearts, then we are not ready to approach the Lord. There's a great story illustrating this of two men. The two men's names were Saprikios and Nikiforos. They were living in the time of the persecution, so early centuries, first three centuries of, of, after Christ. So they had an argument and they became bitter towards one another. And one day, Saprikios was arrested by the pagans and he was thrown in prison with all the other Christians. Well, when Nikiforos found out that Saprikios, his enemy, had been imprisoned, he ran to the jail and knelt outside of his prison cell and begged him for forgiveness. But Saprikios would not grant it. He would not be reconciled to Nikiforos, and he refused. Even when his fellow Christians in the jail were calling on him to, to grant the forgiveness, he would not. So time passed, and eventually it, the time came for the executions of the Christians, which happened often in the early centuries. They were on their way to the execution site, and it was kind of like a procession. And Nikiforos, the one that was not imprisoned, asking for forgiveness, was following the procession, and he was shouting and begging Saprikios to forgive him. But Saprikios only shouted back, I will not forgive you. And in that moment, something terrible happened to Saprikios. When he said that, I will not forgive you, even in that last, and before his death, before his martyrdom, before going to the Lord. As the executions began, Saprikios was watching the Christians be tortured and killed. He lost his courage. He lost the ability to stand up for the Lord and for his gospel. The g divine grace abandoned him because he was not, would not make peace with his brother in the Lord. So when the time came for him to be executed, he denied Christ. And then he was taken out of the line, and Nikiforo saw that there had been an opening. And he jumped forward and proclaimed that he was a Christian. And he was the one, because he was trying to reconcile with Nikiforos, he was the one that was able to take his place, and he was martyred and became a saint of our church. So we too, when we enter the church, we have to do it with a spirit of peace and a spirit of reconciliation with God. Now, the last thing I'll focus on is the response. The response to the, all of the petitions is the same, right? Lord, have mercy. We say it over and over again. St. Nicholas Cavasilas says that it's a dual purpose, that we say this, Lord, have mercy. First of all, by asking for mercy, it shows our gratitude and our confession. Remember the four things that we need for communion. Doxology, thanksgiving, confession, and petition. Well, so far we've talked about doxology, we've talked about petition. The Lord, have mercy, covers the other two. Because we... we we realize that we are receiving our, the petitions, we're receiving our gifts by grace, meaning we're not worthy to receive them. We are recognizing that God has been good to us. We are offering our thanks to him. And then we're also, by recognizing again that we are fallen and broken, we are offering our confession to God, saying, Lord, we are not worthy of these gifts. Have mercy on us. So we are giving our gratitude and our confession. Christ says in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So when we ask God for mercy, therefore, he will make us merciful ourselves. And the reward for being merciful, Christ explains that as well in the parable of the Last Judgment, where he separates the sheep and the goats, and the, sh the sheep are on the right hand and the goats are on the left. The good are on the right and the bad are on the left. How are they divided? They're divided by how merciful they were during their lives, how they took care of their fellow people around them. So turning to the sheep, to the good, he says, come blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the foundation of the world. So the reward of mercy, the reward of receiving God's mercy and being merciful ourselves is the kingdom of heaven, which is our goal in the, in the liturgy and which is why we hear it so often over and over again throughout the liturgy from beginning to end. With that, we'll conclude. May God bless all of you and uh, I hope to see you in the upcoming months as we continue our journey. We have a lot of ground still left to cover, so may God bless you all.
Κινε πρεσβείε ακίμη των Θεοτόκων και προστασίε τα μετάθετων ελπίδων. Τα φω και νεκρόση φούκε κράτησεν πω γαρζό ει μητέρα προ την ζωή μετέστησεν ο μητρανικής σας αΐ.